Designer, creative director, and sartorial socialite, John Buscemi struck gold when he imbued luxury goods with hip-hop swag. This is his blueprint. How did the experience of growing up in EPMD's Long Island in the 80s inform your experience? I've always said that I was very lucky to grow up where I grew up, in the time I grew up, in the place I grew up. Because of those reasons, the EPMDs and the Rock Hymns and the Bizzes and all that stuff, I grew up in a crazy, like a kind of like a quote unquote like Queens vibe, like in Uniondale, Long Island, where it was like upper middle class black and Latino families that were like making it in New York were like Peace, Brooklyn, and Queens. I'm moving to Long Island. So I was influenced by all this crazy like city shit early on because of that migration from, from, you know, the boroughs into Long Island. You know, Trevor Smith, Buster Rhymes, and his brother Paul, like, lived down the block from me. My talent show in junior high, eighth grade, I, I was in seventh grade, and the eighth graders put on, like, this talent show, and it's, like, Buster Rhymes and Charlie Brown doing uh, Big Daddy Kane, R.A.W. Like, that's my junior high school experience. You're now in, like, junior high school. Are you thinking about fashion at all as, like, a profession? In real time, in seventh grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, we were running a business of customizing, like, sweatshirts, t-shirts, hats for people in our neighborhoods. That moment was a real transition for me because making money at 14 years old, 13 years old, like, you know, decent money, you know what I mean? Like money that like a parent would make and then buying sneakers with that. So by the time you're in high school, how many pairs do you have? You know, the amount of sneakers I had was like a, a serious issue, like a problem, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I wasn't just buying one, we were buying the, you know, one to rock, one to stock, whatever the kids say nowadays. <laughs> I imagine that your parents are like, what is going on here? They were never not supportive of anything. They understood it. And I kind of compartmentalized it in the house so enough where they didn't like catch, like too, I didn't catch too much heat. But I moved out of the house right after high school. So that eliminated that problem for them. And you know, I went to work on Wall Street after college. So, okay, so where'd you go to college? So I went to St. John's for a year and a half and okay. I got, got kicked out of the school. I mean, I guess you, you could were say. asked to leave. I was, okay. asked to le I was asked to leave because of my grades. How did you go from college dropout to working on Wall Street? So I'm at this party and it's August and it's right before everyone's about to go back to college. So all my friends are there that are in college, friends that aren't in college, and then this kid shows up. A kid who is basically the dumbest person in my high school, very popular but not very bright, pulls up to the party in a 355, F-355 Spider, silver, I'll never forget it, Ferrari. So we're all like grilling him and he's saying, I, I've been working on Wall Street, I've been working for my uncle at a firm on Wall Street, it's an investment bank, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm killing it. And we're all like, obviously. <laughs> but when you're 19, you don't know the whole backstory. So the party ends and he's about to leave. And like, we were pretty tight in high school because we played the same sport and we just like knew each other. And I was like, dude, let me talk to you for a second. Like, what's really up? Because I'm not going back to college. Like, and I like, I like what's happening here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want to be a part of this. Exactly, let, let me be a part of it. So he goes, you know what? The firm is hiring. I said, oh, word, okay. He got me an interview, and I'll never forget the, the interview, the woman, the head of human resources was Adrian. And I get to Wall Street, it's 10 Wall Street, actually, that's the, the address. This is the interview. If I told you to shovel shit against the wall for a year and you'd be a millionaire, would you do it? I said, yeah, she's like, sign this paper, you start tomorrow. That was it. <laughs> I was like, whoa. So I started as a broker working for this firm. I didn't know what it was at first, so the reason I'm like sounding optimistic is because when I first started, it was like, yo, this is sick. I'm working on Wall Street, I'm wearing a dope suit, like I'm not making a lot of money, but I have a couple bucks. This is, I'm killing it. And then I go to find out, you know, later that it's not the most, it's not the thing that's on the most up and up. But I'm a 21 year old, 22 year old kid making like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then 99, the market crashed, it was like, I lost my entire business. I was making basically zero dollars. Right? How, how quick was the transition from I'm killing it to I'm unemployed and my yeah. like life has come apart? Very quickly. 
very quickly. But I was young enough to know that like, I'm 25 at the time, I'm good. So I've always been around, and this is a whole long story, but I've been connected to skateboarding my whole life. I've skateboarded throughout you know, my teens and all the way up until around 1998 where I quit and I was taking my, my business a little bit more seriously. But I'm connected to this industry. My friends are like the captains of the industry. So I, I packed my car. And I moved to Cal. I just drove to California. One of my best friends is Eric Costin, who's one of the biggest skateboarders in the world. He let me live with him, and I stayed here for four months looking for a job. And I'll never forget. It's about a week before Thanksgiving. I'm here for four months, and nothing happened for me, and it was like devastating. I'm in Eric's car, about to like figure out my like journey back to the East Coast with my like, like my pockets empty and nothing probably go live with my dad. I get a phone call from my friend Wayne and he's like, I'm at DC Shoes. They just hired these dudes from Nike. They're about to like blow this brand up. It's gonna be killer, like sick environment. They're looking for people like you. I'm like, what's that mean? They're, lo they're looking for people that know about sneakers. What is the position that they want to offer you? The position was a product line manager. That was the name of the position, but it was really like a trend forecaster. I got to travel to dozens of countries because they were everywhere and I worked on the international side of the business. I'd, I went to Germany for the first time for a trade show called ISPO. It's the biggest trade show, show in the world for sports. And there was a shop, uh, a Nike store, right outside of this, this show in Munich, and the entire wall was Nike Air Force One NYC edition in Germany. And I realized everyone wants a piece of what we've been doing in New York, and DC wanted a piece of that, and, and we tried to bring that, you know, that, that vibe to the rest of the world. When you get that job though, you have no experience in footwear, apparel, anything having to do with the industry since you were customizing things as a junior high school kid. Right. Um, how quickly were you, at, you, did you just sort of like jump in and fake it till you made it or like how did you, how did you figure it out? I had no fucking clue what I was doing. None. But they didn't hire me to like know it, Excel and Word and to like be able to have a meeting. It was more like, we need to know like why you dress like this, why you know these people, get us, help us with that. So how does your time at DC come to an end? So I'm at DC, one of the best experiences of my life. I have basically my PhD in footwear after two and a half years. As a creative, I got bored, you know, and I just said, you know, I need to figure something out. So Greg Lucci, who actually worked at Complex, I think on the early days, he was in LA and I met him through Greg Johnson who owns Snafu and Situation Normal and they were gonna start this American Italian thing. And I'm in DC and I had an idea to start a brand called Gourmet which was a streetwear brand based in food. It was like, oh my God, let's all do this together. So we joined forces, I moved to LA, we started Gourmet. So we launched at the Capsule Show down in Angel Orange Sands in East Village and nothing happens because it's 2007, the recession hit. It was just like a complete nightmare. We made all these samples, it was sick. We had uh, sweatsuits from Italy, cashmere hoodies. We were way ahead of the curve and nothing happened. So we come back the next season and Greg Johnson had an idea to deconstruct the Jordan. And Luch was like, we should do the seven and the 11. So we took a Jordan seven and 11, we deconstructed it like a Chuck Taylor just made out of canvas and we put it on a Ked sole. We went to the trade show with six colors and we went from doing nothing to selling like 15,000 pairs of shoes in like, like, like one trade show. It went completely bonkers. We went from this like Italian American sportswear brand to a sneaker company, like overnight. Though not wholly original, the modified formula equaled success for Gourmet, but the brand would have to tangle with a Titan in order to move forward. How many of these did you have to sell before it landed on Nike's radar? The first season we sold, we sold about 10 or 15,000 pairs, I forget what it was. It was the next season. It hit the press. Yeah. Fucking hard. It didn't get on their radar for about six months. Okay. But it was the worst time to get on their radar actually because it was the time that the thing went like this and we 
made all this product that's in like in product in like containers on boats coming to this country that is like okay you can't sell any of this stuff anymore you know? i don't know if you've ever been served no. with a lawsuit they throw it at you kind of and they're gone it was like a 50 count federal lawsuit trademark trade dress infringement like we're we're gonna like blow you to smithereens when you came up with the idea did it cross your mind do you have a conversation about this this may okay. attract the wrong kind of attention okay so i don't know if you remember what the names of the shoes were but we named the shoe the cease and the desist <laughs> so yes we knew this is the best part so we our lawyer calls their lawyer and says we, we want to talk, right? And then we don't hear anything back. Basically, we have to respond to the lawsuit in the court. So what we do is we counter sue Nike for antitrust. Some, one of their sales reps told someone at DQM, Dave's Quality Meats, that if you sell gourmet, you can't get Jordans anymore. That's a huge problem. That's a huge antitrust problem. And we had a document from Dave's Quality Meats saying, this Nike sales rep said this to us. They call us immediately, come up to Portland. Get up to the room, they look at us, they're like, we're all like well-dressed, we're wearing Nike, our attorney's like, cool guy. They're just like, wait a minute, who, we got the wrong paperwork here. These are, these are just guys that are trying to like pay homage. Look, it's wrong. We knocked their product off. So they were like, look, take the guns away, you know what I mean? Just don't, don't make these shoes anymore. We said, good, we shook their hand. And they were very gracious, you know? So what, what do we have here? This is the federal lawsuit, the plaintiff, Nike Inc. versus Gourmet, the defendant. Oh, yeah. March 20th, 2008. Oof, we got the federal seal there and everything. That they just sent you a <laughs> list of all the things that they own just in, to just make... Just in case. Yeah. Just in case. Oh, did you want to design this? Okay, maybe you should fall back. <laughs> <laughs> you resolve the Nike situation without them repossessing your entire life. Exactly. Which is positive, but I imagine this puts the business in a somewhat precarious situation. What really killed the business for getting about pointing fingers at people was Nike... Adidas and Vans really kind of just like started to own the lifestyle shoe space where independent brands were kind of owning that lane. It's hard to compete against, you know, people with billion dollar budgets. So, and along with some mismanagement and not running a business correctly, it kind of just started to fizzle. As a part of my exit strategy for Gourmet, I'm launch I'm going to launch my own brand. Okay. But it wasn't really a brand per se, it was more of a project. And I always say this, it was a project in the fact that I wanted to launch some items that I thought would be dope, real simple. So I put a collection together of what the flyest dude in the neighborhood would, be, would need. Like that was like kind of the, the brief. So I made like the sickest handmade leather weekender bag that was like you could fit a small man in. It was huge. <laughs> I made the sickest dog leash with an 18 karat gold clasp with a leather pull. I made a coffee sleeve, like $150 like calfskin hand painted gold handle like Java jacket. I did a leather tie and then I made the 100 millimeter sneaker. How did the idea for the 100 millimeter come to you? I've always been enamored by the Hermes Birkin bag. It's been like something that's always been on my mind from the cultural part of it, the allure of it, the whole, I just, just something about a coveted product always like kind of gets me off. I just love that. I drew the sneaker deconstructing a Birkin bag onto like a classic, uh, you know, sneaker silhouette. And it was just an idea. It was just kind of like a concept. Like what if you took a handbag and made it into a sneaker? At the same time, my friend Nino Scalia contacted us as a group to relaunch ice cream sneakers with Pharrell. This has just happened to happen during the same time. This is like 2011, this is, 2012? This is 2012, early 2012, mid 2012. We're having this meeting about ice cream sneakers. And we're showing Pharrell things we've done at Gourmet, things we've, things we've done in our past. He's like, cool, cool, cool. We're there with his team. And 
I'm going on to like the next slide on my computer and then I go click on my Adobe Illustrator and instead of like a project that I was working on to show him, to get him excited about what we could do for ice cream, that shoe, the 100 millimeter, the, 100 millimeter, the, the, the most famous shoe that is in this brand, he sees and it's just like, it's almost like the world stopped for him for a second. He was just like, he just like got up, he started like, he like took his hat off, he's like, what the fuck is that thing? What, 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 what is happening? So I explained to him, this is just a concept that I'm doing for my own brand, which I'll be launching very soon. And it was, the details are very, there weren't any details. I was just kind of thinking about starting this project. So we leave. I start privately meeting with Pharrell over this kind of like, we're gonna, this isn't gonna be a shoe for the Buscemi brand. It was more like, we're gonna launch this shoe together. And he was gonna put it in his line and be like the collaboration, like John Buscemi designs a shoe together with BBC or he had Beeline at the time, which was like the high-end BBC brand. Okay. So then I meet with him for the last time to show him the final sample. And he's like, you know, I've been thinking, I think, uh, I think I just want the shoe for me and then I'll name it the Buscemi. And I was like, for real? <laughs> I was like, kind of like grabbed my stuff and was like, you know, man, it's not gonna work for me. And I just like bounced basically. And then I got a call later from like someone from his squad and it was like, yeah, what the fuck? Like, I was like, dude, like kind of a letdown, but like, I get it. Happy was on the radio at the time. Like he was popping, you know, but major letdown for me. But funny, I launched my brand, you know, and we went on to obvious glory with the brand and the shoe kind of set this thing off. Why does it take 24 hours to make one of these pairs of sneakers? Okay, so there's a few reasons. The sole and then the upper of the shoe. The sole is the quickest thing to make. It's made out of 100% natural rubber. It's a few hour process to make the sole. It cools down. So we're adding numbers together to get yeah. to 24. Each shoe has hand painted edges on every edge of the shoe, which takes an immense amount of time. So you have to paint the edge and you have to let it dry and it's a four step process and then sanding and then they paint it one last time around the edge. So it's overdone in a way, it's not necessary I can say, but from a style and a look standpoint, it's amazing and also from a from a lasting, so the edges of the leather will never fray and it'll be perfect for till the end of time. It just takes a long time to do. How do you go about putting together the pieces to finance Buscemi as a line and you know, how does it transition from being uh, this sort of broad array of luxury items into a more focused footwear line? We influence the greatest stores on the planet to buy this shoe. And in turn, people that shop at those stores were influenced very quickly as well. I think Justin Bieber gets those shoes because he's in Toronto at Serpentine that only carried Rick Owens, they carried Raph, they carried like all these dope brands, was very curated, and then one day, he shops at that store all the time, and he goes in and there's three colors of that shoe. It's a co-sign thing, you know, mm -hmm. we, we got, we got co-signed by the best stores in the world. In turn, also the shoe looked dope, and that's how it happened. We didn't send the shoes to Beaver, we didn't send the shoes to Puff, we didn't send the shoes to JLo, these people all bought them at, influential store, stores around the world. So you take it to market in 2013? Yeah, so 2013 and in February of the next year, in 2014, we get our own showroom. We went from selling to five stores around the world to 50 stores. And 50 stores buying 10 times the amount of shoes that the first five bought. So it was like, you know, we went from doing, you know, 300 pairs of shoes to three, 4,000 pairs of shoes. And at a, you know the price. At a thousand dollar price. Exactly. Rate. So it was very, very life changing experience for me. With Buscemi, you've done it more or less by yourself. Obviously, with you know right. collaborators, right. but it's it's you. Um, do you prefer that paradigm to having to negotiate with people? I think at the end of the day, when I went out to do this on my own, and not knowing that running something by myself would be this successful. Now, in, 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 in hindsight, and you bringing it up makes me think the thing that I've been most successful at has been something that I've done on my own. So, although I do love collaborating with people, I think at the end of the day, when you're doing something this specific, 
you can't have too much noise. So we, we recently moved to this space because we outgrew our old space. We had a space in West Hollywood, which was like a live work situation, which was really dope. But we outgrew it, we moved to this space because of the uniqueness of it and also the neighborhood. This is an old recording studio and also our neighbors are like partisan films like Michel Gondry and his crew. So it's like a lot of great, it's just like a, a dope vibe over here. How many people work, work for Buscemi in total? We're just shy of 40. Okay. That's where you want to be at right now? I think so, yeah. I mean, for now, you know, lean, mean. Um, that doesn't include the retail staff, which eventually will grow. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's where we're at. It's a, good, it's a good size. With the 100 millimeter sneaker a certified success, Buscemi now looks to expand his product line beyond its defining star. I've noticed part of your success along the way has been the ability to articulate and commodify your experience growing up, even up into gourmet, because in, in many ways that is an expression of the sort of, you know, uh, fundamental principles and interests that you had as a kid growing up with hip hop. Does it ever surprise you as time goes on that like that experience continues to keep you so far ahead of all these major companies and other people in the space? I mean, that's amazingly said, and that's what drives me, you know. The people that we've been surrounded by, everything that we've done in our lives, everything that goes back to hip hop or whatever we did in New York City, you see what we've done in this little group of people in New York, and you see what's happening around the world, it's all based on kind of this little period of time, like almost everything. You, your first two jobs you got without any experience, strictly off of networking and a good talk game. Are, are you conscious of how you sort of network within communities? And do you feel like the talk game, do you work at that? Or is that, was it, are these just sort of inherent things that are part of your personality? I think that's because of my personality. And I always stuck up for the, like, like the fat kid that was getting beat up like back in, in elementary school. I always like sticking up for people. And I think that comes off in like, it's an innate thing. That's like a, it's a subconscious thing. So when I'm talking to someone, people feel comfortable with me maybe, and they give me a shot. And also luck, right? I got very lucky for the people that I've been surrounded by, you know, growing up in New York and the hip hop scene and the skateboarding scene. And like the people that I'm connected to are all very influential people on the planet. You know, and that like goes a long way. And then it's like, oh, you're at this party because I knew this person. And then now I'm at a job interview and I know like 14 people that work here already. So like, I'm already good, you know what I mean? So it's like part of this like network, this New York network that kind of has helped me a great deal. And it's just being lucky, you know? I would imagine in making sneakers like this, there are, you know, forces that are sort of, uh, want you at every turn to try to like cut corners on costs for this or that. How is it that you stayed so true to your sort of luxury intent of the product? You know, when it comes to the product, we needed to separate ourselves from everybody else and step above to actually compete. That was part of the ethos and the mantra and like after the dust settles of the social media hype and this guy wearing it and that guy wearing it, the person who's the end consumer has to be like, why did I just pay for this? Is there sort of a double-edged sword in having such an outsized success with one specific item within your product line? For sure. We're known for this high top, you know, 100 millimeter sneaker, but as the brand grew, and especially over the past two years, we've, we've kind of fanned out a bit, so there's the percentage of that shoe that was kind of like the, the bulk of the 100% of the business from the beginning has, you know, it's it's definitely diversified for now. We've launched women's, we'll be growing that. We launched small leather goods, we'll be growing that. And then eventually looking to do some fly apparel. When you were doing gourmet, you were going up against these titans within the footwear industry. You're now going up against, you know, storied fashion houses that have owned the luxury market for literally a century, you know, plus. Um, what is the key to competing in that space? For us to stay relevant, I think what we're gonna do is since we're connected to the street a bit more than where they are like, 
I wouldn't say stealing, but they're definitely appropriating what we do and what we've created. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to go right back to where I came from and do really cool partnerships, collaborations with people that I respect that have relevancy in this industry. Did you ever have any expectation as a kid buying sneakers, even getting in started at DC, that you would be able to achieve this level of success? If my mother were still alive, she would tell you that when I was at a very, very young age, I used to say that I was going to be successful and I was like, it's just basically a hip hop, like hustler's dream, you know what I'm saying? Like we grew up in a hip hop community, I grew up listening to hip hop, I was obviously in the skate scene as well, but hip hop really is the foundation of everything I do, right? So. I always want to have a better car than my friend. I always want to have the better sneakers. I want to have more money than you. Like that's always been the basis of it. So yeah, the answer is a 100% yes.